Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Geek Wave. This is the low-budget show. It's the show so low it has no budget. And this week, more than any other week, really, we have an even smaller budget than normal because we have no main topic to dive into. That's right, folks. It's an all-news edition of The Geek Wave. There was a lot we could cover this week, so I'm like, well, instead of spending some time dedicated to that, I guess we could dive more into it. I didn't have the time to find a topic anyways, and we have spent a while on other topics, so I was like, well, let's just uh, let's just dive into it, see what we got. Maybe something good will come about it. Maybe it won't. Who's to say? But we're going to do it anyways, you know? Good stuff to talk about. Important things in geek culture. And yeah, we've done all news ones before, but this is like the first all news edition we've done that wasn't connected to like a Comic Con or a D23 or a DC fandom. I think in in like two years since I've been doing this that we've done one. It has been quite the minute. It has been some time and I figured this would just be a fun thing to explore and see what we could do. So let's get into it. You know, we'll start with the big topic. This was the news of last week. I kind of already talked about it on the Geek Beach that was prematurely cut off, but uh, this news is kind of fascinating, and I don't know if I'm going to spend too much time dwelling on this one in particular, but we will be talking about other news. So, Hugh Jackman, you know him, the music man himself who has been spending the past couple of years going from show to show with a song in his heart and a pep in his step, dancing his way through the world, he has signed a deal... I don't know, I guess I don't, I shouldn't really say it's a deal he signed, but he will be returning to the world of the Marvel Universe through the visage that is Deadpool 3. So Ryan Reynolds took to his Twitter saying like, I know he missed D23, but my Twitter campaign is way bigger than anything we could do at D23. So I was hard at work trying to come up with what we're going to do for Deadpool 3. The only idea I had is to get Hugh Jackman back as Wolverine. Hugh was there too. He's like, yeah, sure. Thus is the case of Deadpool 3, a Wolverine and Deadpool joint. Sean Levy, who has worked with Ryan Reynolds on pretty much everything he's done in recent times, he did The Atom Project, uh, what's that other one? Free Guy, I think there was another one I can't remember. All those movies I don't like. Again, I talked about this a little bit last week. I am not a Ryan Reynolds fan. I, I've never found his shtick interesting. It has never endured or made me smile or done anything I think is fun or creative or made me go, yeah, this is brilliant. It worked well in like the Van Wilder, two guys, a girl in a pizza place era. But I think the older he's gotten, the more the shtick has turned into Joel McHale for me, where it's like, oh yeah, I get that you're doing something kind of cool here, but it's not for me and I don't find it very fascinating or interesting. So... I'm not excited for any of his like projects that he's working on. What excites me about this project, the more I've been thinking about it, is just, yeah, that's kind of cool. These two guys are friends, and they probably have good chemistry together off screen, so on screen that could translate. Or it could be like Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart, where they have great chemistry off screen, but on screen they are boring as fuck. Could be either way. But I don't... I don't have a, like a stake in this race. I don't have like a horse in this race, I should say. I don't care. I've, I've, I'm have I've kind of done with Jackman's Wolverine. Like, I think the ending he gave in Logan was fitting. I don't need to see him return. I don't need to see that be like a triumphant comeback to a character. But also, if he returns, that's not going to tarnish anything for me. I know there's people that are just like, oh man, Stallone doing another Rambo tarnishes first blood. It's like none of these things matter to me. If you want to come back 12 years later to do a movie like that, do it. None of this matters. It's entertainment. It will never take away from that good thing they did before that. It's just trying to like ride the high for as long as you can. And that's why some things just burn themselves out so fast. It happens more frequently than people realize. But Hugh ended on a high note. So coming back to the MCU, essentially, it doesn't feel like it's a bad thing. It definitely makes sense for him. You know, go out on top. You've done pretty much everything else you could in that universe aside from putting on the iconic suit and working with the MCU characters. So I get it. I get it. If they were like, it's Ty Sheridan coming back or Sophie Turner, the news wouldn't be as important. But if it's Hugh Jackman doing something with his buddy, that makes sense to me. Now, I was kind of joking earlier that it's probably for a big pay grade, you know, a lot of fucking money. 
I, I bet you it's not as much as we'd be expecting. It feels like, because he said openly to he's like, I'm the only person that makes my decisions. I wanted to do this, so I'm going to do it. Which leads me to think, oh, you're getting a lot more money than you're telling us, or you're getting less than you're telling us because you are genuinely interested in doing this. But either way, I don't really care. My only concern with this entire news is that it might detract from doing another Wolverine later, where if we get a proper X-Men in the established Marvel Cinematic Universe, I don't think anybody really wants that to be Hugh Jackman, but if we were to have that movie be successful, would we be scared to cast a younger, more gruffer, maybe a person of color, Wolverine? I still... I've been saying this forever, and I know it's kind of like a topic that nobody really agrees with me on or has gone into. I say just don't do Logan and just do Laura. That's I've been saying that forever. And I know I wanted to start fresh. I love Daphne Keen. I think she'd be great the older she got to fit into that role. But I was thinking, like, uh, what's the girl's name from Reservation Dogs that uh, I'm going to look it up, actually. Uh, she's cast in Echo. But I think she would have been a great fit for Laura. So, Kay Devery Jacobs, I think you get her. And she would have been a fantastic, a really fun Laura X-23 Wolverine. And that's the direction you go. But I feel like having Hugh come back, it's going to scare them away from trying that. You know? And that kind of sucks. I think we could have done something cool there, but... That's fine. You know, again, it means nothing to me. Good news for somebody who cares. It'll just be a piece of entertainment we have. I I genuinely can't get excited for that. It'll just exist. But what I can get excited for, because this is beyond interesting to me, is Disney who... Disney's kind of like in love with their adaptations right now. You know, they're like, well, we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. We'll be booting everything for you. We doing all this crazy stuff. They have taken to, to the internet world and they said, hey, guess what, everybody? Do you remember Figment? You know, like the purple dragon who sometimes wears a sweater, who is like the mascot of Epcot because Epcot had like the imagination station and that was like, you know, Figment of your imagination. Do you get it? Well, they are Disney, the fine folks at Disney are finally going to be making a Figment movie. Which you're like, what? Why would we be doing that? Seems very specific for something that nobody knows about. <laughs> but okay, I, I guess if you want to, like that's an idea to play with. Seth Rogen is attached to have his studio or like his production company be involved in it. So Dan Hernandez and Benji Summit from Pokemon Detective Pikachu are set to write the film. Um... I guess there's something to explore. Do you remember, like, a while ago? This was kind of, like, the beginning... I think it was even before Disney Plus came out, but there was, like, this idea being presented that, like, John Favreau was going to work on this, like, big Disney Parks, like, story. It was, like, Disney... Uh, it was, like... What was it? Like, Disney... The key-, key Holder or something, where, like, these kids get access to the parks and it transports them to all, like, the worlds of, like, Tomorrow World and... Uh, what are the other ones? Animation, Mickey's Toontown, and I guess you could put Epcot in there or something. Like this big idea where it's gonna be like this expansive story where it's like all the like parks and worlds of Disney World come to life and you can go to all these places. This kind of has that feeling to me, but I, I, you know, I do guess there is something you could do with Figment. There was like those weird Marvel comics that came out where it's like, hey, here's the dragon story, Disney Kingdoms. Do you guys remember Disney Kingdoms? Like those weird Marvel comics. I guess you could do like a steampunky fantasy kind of story. I just, you already did Pete's Dragon, so what's the point? It's just weird. I hope it's not like Detective Pikachu because that would be really boring. But if it's like this is a dragon that's kind of like the gatekeeper of like the realm of imagination, this could be Disney's Sandman. And I wonder if the success of Sandman kind of like sparked these rumors to start flying up for this this movie where it's like, oh yeah, we could actually do this and people will get genuinely excited to see it. That I, I like I genuinely believe that is something that could have been talked about for that film. Because Figment's not an iconic character. I, I feel like there's gonna be a lot more think pieces about him and something happening that's gonna make the character likable, whatever. There is a special place in the hearts of people that like him. 
you know, all those people, they have their reviews, talk about what they like. But when are we going to get Orange Bird? You know, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I just like, I was, I'm going down a rabbit hole now, kind of looking at these other Disney characters that are kind of just like their own thing. Like, you know, the Hatbox Ghost will be Jared Leto in that movie. Why Disney said Jared Leto, I don't understand for that. It's so weird. You got Billy the Disney Goat. What do we got here? Bunch of other just random things. Spike the Bee, I've never heard of this character, but they exist. They appeared in Donald Duck cartoons, you know. And then look, Briar Fox. Ooh, let's not touch the Briar characters because we don't want to do that. Yikes. Unrelated to all of this, I have just started to listen to Podcast The Ride because I'm kind of getting back in that like amusement park spirit where I'm like, I want to learn more about these things. Let me hear them. It's really fun to hear professional, like, <laughs> you know, podcasters talk about amusement parks and just stuff like that. Very fun. So, yeah, a Figment movie. Stay tuned for that. It's coming up sooner than later. And also something coming sooner than later in 2024. Unbelievable that this is coming so soon. The Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. We have officially gotten our first key artwork for the new Planet of the Apes movie. I couldn't be happier. Everybody who has been here, a longtime fan, they all know, you know, I am a huge, massive fan of the Planet of the Apes franchise. Next to the Muppets and Tron, I would say Planet of the Apes is my favorite franchise of all time. I love the world. I loved the last trilogy. I am I'm genuinely amazed that's how good storytelling has got for that franchise. So, Wes Ball, who did the Maze Runner films, will be the director. And I think he wrote it? Did he? I think, yeah, I think he wrote the script, too. And the... Young lady from the Witcher series, who was a Freya Allen, I think, she will be cast as the lead actor in that series, which I'm like, okay, that's kind of fun. They didn't show a lot about it. The key artwork they showed, big kingdoms and big like metropolitan cities overrun by vines and leaves and weeds, which is awesome. It looks fucking awesome. And then this... this the ape's on horseback, and he's got a freaking, like, falcon that rests on his arm. You're like, dude, stop making things directly aimed for me. I can't keep up with this anymore. And I'm, it's, like, set hundreds of years in the future from the previous one. You're like, yes, because those movies were so good, and the world evolved from that. I'm like, dude, this is so good. This is what I've wanted my whole life. Like, I have been telling people off camera or off mic forever something I have been saying desperately about this franchise. You need to make it feel like the Old West, like an establishing world is being built. They have new technologies on the horizon. They have new currencies and ways of being on the horizon. That is what you should do when you are just starting off for the Planet of the Apes. So that when you hear the name Kingdom, it goes to more like a medieval theme, but there's horsebacks, they have access to guns, and one's got a freaking bird. And that all leads me to believe we're doing something old westy and i'm like oh west did you hear me talk about this somewhere on some other podcast i love this news more than anything like this is my franchise and you can bet your bottom dollar the very second we get to apes season i'll be talking about every freaking movie in detail and in depth because i love everything about this i have all of the NECA action figures from the dawn and rise line i should go back and get the old ones oh man Apes are just freaking sweet, man. And I love the, I just love the style that this is going for. I love the tone of this. Today's modern technology, I could just only imagine the wonders we could build in this world with these characters. It could look spectacular. It could be breathtaking. New original stories with better voices and better movements. I think if Avatar The Way of Water is successful, which it's going to be, because James Cameron cannot put out a piece of shit, we're going to be entering this new era of storytelling where, one, it's not going to be like, you know, the Pol Polar Express era where things look like shit. It's going to be, oh, no, we can actually hire actors to do these motion capture things and look like this, like they do with The Way of Water, like they're doing for the Planet of the Apes trilogy that just came out. And when that becomes the case, I think it's going to open the door for more opportunities to expand and get better cool stories. Like, personally... I've been sitting on like a really cool pitch for a movie I've had for a long time, but the characters can't be done because they don't look human enough. But if things like this are successful, those types of stories are going to become more prominent. If I'm saying this, it's a dangerous slope that we're potentially heading down 
But you have to imagine, because there was an announcement for this a couple years back, if the success of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes takes off and people are like, holy shit, those apes look baller AF, you can only imagine, only imagine what that could mean for Thundercats and He-Man. Because if that's successful, those are obviously where you're going to go next, you know? Oh, I cannot wait. It excites me to no end that that is where we are going with stuff. Like, I just think it's entirely cool and creative, and I cannot wait to see what that's going to be. And moving away from there, we got a couple pieces of Marvel news to talk about. So we're going to start with the two key ones, and I'll jump down to some other stuff kind of at the end. They, I guess you could consider the last piece of news, like my main theme of this video. The first thing is, Basim Tariq, who was the director attached to Blade, has reportedly stepped away due to some whatever's going on. Production was set to start very soon. I believe within days of this video going live, it was supposed to start. And now it looks like it's going to be halting production for a bit. On top of all that for Blade, there was reports coming out that the script wasn't good. Mahershala was like fed up with the way production was going. Kevin Feige wasn't writing the show well enough. Things were getting like spread out too thin. And I, I don't know all the details, but I have to agree with that because nothing was said about Blade in any of the, these recent announcements. They were talking 2025, and this one is starting production in, a, in like two days. And they haven't been talking about it in the slightest. And you got to imagine, like, that really hurts. It feels like the forgotten baby of this universe. Now, there's a lot of things you could do. They've been talking about certain directors to step up, maybe. Michael Giacchino, who just did the successful Werewolf by Night, could potentially be a good choice. But you just have to imagine when you're Mahershala, who's signed on to this for years now, that this is not a good thing to, to say or to hear. But here's, here's where I'm standing on things, right? I hear... A Marvel movie has a 90-page script, two lackluster action sequences, and my reaction is, oh, please, for the love of God, film that. Like, I, I, I've i written full feature-length scripts. I have... Writing is hard, you know? And I don't... We'll get into it more when we talk about some of, like, the other news I have at the end here, but writing is hard. And I have... I mean, I have written a full feature script that is longer than that. But I'm like, oof, it is so hard to like get a story, especially when like your story is like specific. It's hard to get that right. And yes, I know people are like, well, a page is about a minute of screen time. You can add things up and make it longer. So I would say like a 90 page script would be between 90 to 105 minutes if you really push things to a certain aesthetic. And besides, if there's fight scenes, you just extend those out longer. And that's not including credits or anything, right? Just the just the actual thought of that where it's like you can be in and out of a Marvel movie in under two hours, in under an hour 40, and get a, a good enough story, I'm, I'm genuinely hurting for that right now. It's kind of why Werewolf by Night is so bloody exciting to me. Because I'm like, we are not doing something extreme here. We are telling a simple, easygoing story. Like, don't overstay your welcome, babe. And I just, I want that so badly. We have this, like, insane notion as a culture that movie should be longer to feel like feature length things, but you don't need that. You know, I recently have been watching a lot of the Universal Monster films. In particular, we just did a video on Creature from the Black Lagoon, which is 80 minutes long. And I think you get a lot of story and depth in the characters in those 80 minutes. So it's all about writing. And I, again, I would love to read this 90 page script, but that gets me more excited than be like, we need to extend this to a two hours and 12 minute long movie. I'm like, no, no, you don't. They just said Wakanda Forever is two hours and 41 minutes. And I'm like, no, please stop. I didn't like Love and Thunder at all, but it made me nostalgic for those films where they don't have to be over two hours because you haven't earned the right to do that. I don't know. I don't know. If a Blade film, you don't have too much story you need to explore. So making it longer doesn't feel necessary to me. But what do I know, you know? And this kind of kind of blends into another topic I wanted to bring up. So there's these two things that I think kind of coexist with each other. The first one is the Armor Wars TV series, which I said when they announced it, like this is the one I'm the most excited for. They are reworking it to become a feature-length film. And I'm like, oh, you're finally learning. You're finally learning. Aside from WandaVision and She-Hulk Attorney at Law, 
none of their shows have earned the right to be six episodes and TV shows. All of those seem like they should have been movie scripts. Even drop the freaking movie on Disney+, Plus. you have not earned the right for all those to be as long as they were. So, Armor War is probably being the most expensive because it's Iron Man armors. Don Cheadle is an older actor who is veteran in this world. He deserves a bigger pay raise. I 100% support the idea to up that to a film. I also think it just goes to show you, like, yeah, you're probably not making a lot of money on Disney+. Plus. I Like, it's the thing about streaming that I don't think people understand because there's no ads on streaming. You're not making your revenue from people sh- like putting ads on that platform. You have a limited amount of revenue coming in every day. I don't understand how like these companies keep making money from that. I guess it doesn't really matter, but you only have a finite of subscribers, so your your income is not going up a certain amount. That's why these companies keep having to increase their prices. Like you're not getting higher. So I don't understand where that's going, but I guess it like, no, it does make sense to me. I should say it does make sense to me that this one that would be very freaking expensive would make more sense as a movie because an Iron Man based film without RDJ still makes money because it's the, it's the character. Okay. I think it's the character over RDJ, honestly, because if it was RDJ, people would have seen Doolittle, you know, and it's not, I think it's the character. So I, I get that. Like you're going to get an actual income and release and money when you're doing a theatrical film. And Don Cheadle's earned it. You know, put Samuel L. Jackson on the small screen if you want. Secret Invasion should have been a movie because that would have a great tone and feel to it. But yeah, this one makes sense. I I, I like the idea of this movie existing. I think it means we could get cooler stuff. Hopefully it comes out sooner than later. I'm going to guess a 2024 release. I feel like it could maybe be like the surprise one if they start filming soon. But I maybe 2025, like a February 2025 wouldn't surprise me if that's where it was dropped. I haven't seen the release schedule in a minute, so it might be after the Avengers films, but I don't know. It's all okay, I guess, you know, none of it really means anything. But there's some other news attached to that that I kind of want to bring up. It's kind of like a rumor going around right now. It kind of springs off this, so I thought it was worth mentioning. Just kind of this idea that because, you know, we're turning this into a movie, we are looking at some of our other projects, and we just got a guy who is going to take the position of, like, Marvel Studios special presentation, like the head of that division. So to me, it kind of, like, makes sense that they're going to be looking at other series that could be in development and maybe learning, like, oh, we should actually just turn that into a special presentation. That doesn't need to be a feature. That doesn't need to be a long six episodes. We can turn that into something shorter. Now, I don't have their list in front of me of the stuff that they would do that to, but Secret Invasion is done. Echo is currently being developed, and Ironheart is filming. So... I'm going to assume that in particular would be Agatha Coven of Chaos and maybe I, I see Wonder Man could just become the sitcom. So I would have to see their upcoming projects to really see like which ones they could change. But I, right now I'm just thinking like it's probably they're saying that for Coven of Chaos because that's like the only one I think you would really change. Like I don't I don't know what else they could really do. But it is what it is, I guess, right? Because which one? Because I guess if you just wanted to keep like the horror characters to the special presentation, so it's like here's a Bloodstone movie, here's like a Man Thing movie, like a Dead of Night featuring Man Thing or a Journey into Fear or something, that would make sense for those characters. But yeah, I get it. Don't extend your stories. It probably costs. You shouldn't be making a TV show that's that fucking ugly for two hundred million dollars. It's not working for you. It hasn't worked for you. Stop doing it. Let's move away from Marvel for a minute because we got more stuff we want to cover, starting with something that we all kind of speculated might be dropped, but the Northman kind of got like its video on demand release, bump it up to an actual profitable film, which means Robert Eggers can finally do his Nosferatu film. We are going to see instead of Harry Styles, could... I can't imagine something I would hate less than Harry Styles in that movie. Bill Skarsgård is Count Orloff. I'm like, yep, that makes sense. The man looks like a freak. He perfectly fits into whatever world 
Eggers wants to cra- craft. I haven't not, I haven't hated a single Eggers film. I think he's a fantastic visionary director. I really liked The Northman more than a lot of people. I really liked The Lighthouse more than a lot of people. And I really liked The Witch more than a lot of people. He's amazing. A Nosferatu film is perfect for him. I cannot wait to see what that's going to be. And instead of Anya Taylor-Joy, his like go-to little lady friend, because I'm not really a fan of Anya Taylor-Joy, it's going to be Lily Rose Depp. And I'm like, okay, that's an interesting choice. I Have I seen her do any real acting aside from yoga hosers? I don't know. But she's fine, I guess. I mean, I don't really have anything against it, but I like this duo. You know, Skarsgård is a fantastic force. Barbarian was just a stellar performance he gave in that. And Depp could do something good. I guess just to, like, get the name of Depp better into public consciousness is a great idea. And of course, of course, if you're going to do Nosferatu again, you got to get somebody who loves filming in that style, like the certain aspect ratios, the certain color palette. He's the perfect choice for this. Because you can't, and I, I'll talk about this more when I do a Nosferatu video, because I'm going to do one this month. You can't do The Invisible Man. You know, like 2019's Invisible Man, you can't update that character for the modern times unless you're doing like a joke of like what we do in the shadows. It has to remain in the time period that movie takes place in. It can't be for in like the present day. It doesn't work. It needs to be a period piece that looks creepy and weird. And I know my man Bobby knows how to do some shadow work, baby awesome and bobby please bobby eggs man if you're listening and i know you're not but man if we ever get in touch you just just you wait till you hear what you and me are gonna do with the wolfman my man when we when we get together we're gonna paint me up and turn me into the wolfman dude that's that's the plan so everyone tweet, tweet up bobby eggs to get the rights to the wolfman so i can just scream on camera for a bit and have a good thing happen Love it. Nosferatu, baby. It's coming. It's it's down the pipeline. Something else that's been in development for a long time that they finally announced is hashtag six seasons and a freaking movie, baby. We finally got announcement. Dan Harmon returning to produce this community movie. I have a lot of thoughts on this, and I I know before the movie releases next year on Peacock, I will be doing an entire talk about community because I was there, not day one, but if you look at like the the life of Community, I was there beginning of season two. That's when I got on the show. I was there. I saw an NBC ad. I'm like, okay, that's creative. I was there early on in the show, and I've loved it ever since. I really liked what it did for storytelling, and it was innovative, and it was cool. But I'm also in that state of mind where I'm like, I don't need to see this. I've never really, like, seen a movie from a TV show that made me go, yeah, this deserved to exist. I'm glad this exists. Even The Simpsons movie, which is a movie I really adore, I could have gone my life without having it. And Community is that show where it's it's had as a cursed half-life from its conception. Ever since season two and, like, the halfway point of season three, it's kind of fallen down, fallen down, fallen down. Literally destroyed a company at Yahoo because it didn't make any money. And everyone has just been clamoring for it. But the thing is, Dan has always said, like, the audience has been there. They just weren't watching it on the right platforms. I argue that nobody wants to watch this anymore. And the thing is, like, Glover and Nicole Brown aren't signed up yet. And I know Yvette was talking about it on Twitter. I just can't get excited for this. You know, it's seven years removed, like, this year. So eight years when the movie comes out, it'll be removed from the finale of Community. And there, I don't think there's any like real fascinating story to tell. You could do something where Abed's making the movie of Community, and it's kind of like a meta textual narrative that way, or maybe they're gonna go find Troy or something. But seeing them all come back now, I don't think there's anything fun to explore in that way. If that makes sense, I don't believe there's anything that deserves to be talked about. I like the show. I love the show. But I am can I just can't get amped for this. It feels too little too late. And that is always something that bothers me when it's like, we're well, we're trying to be cool here and get you back in the seats to watch this. But I'm just, I'm not the guy for it. You know, I have a, one of my closest cousins and I kind of bonded over the show during season four. And we're both like, this is kind of weird. 
but I know we're just like, this is okay, I guess. I don't, I don't know. It's like, I don't think there's a real interesting story to go in there. And like I said, Joel McHale can't be a leading man. You cannot base this on Jeff anymore. Like that fun doesn't work anymore now that he's going to be close to 50. It doesn't work. It's not funny. It's not cool. He's really ruining Stargirl this season for me. And I don't want, know if I want to see him come back. I guess Allison Bree deserves a chance to lead something. And Jim Rash coming off of Bros could definitely hold his own. But I'm just not interested in this anymore. I just can't find myself excited. So the community movie. Okay, it exists. Officially getting it. I will be talking about it. There's a couple of those more like straight to streaming movies I want to cover. There's a couple coming out this month and next month I want to cover. I can't wait to talk about, but cool. Something else really excited to talk about because I genuinely am curious about this concept. Sony Pictures has been like, yo, guess what? We're going to do another Tarzan, biatches. We're going to update and reinvent this character for the modern audiences. And all I'm thinking... All I'm thinking is, what the fuck do you mean you're reinventing Tarzan for the modern audiences? How do you do that? What does that mean exactly? Because the story doesn't have technology. Like, he come like, is it going to be like colonialism again? Where like this kid is like, like, it's so bizarre to me. And this is going from a guy who I grew up on Tarzan content. Like my grandfather was a Tarzan maniac. He has the I, the only person I know who has like an entire collection of like the old golden key and gold western old school Tarzan comic books and the son of Tarzan comic books and the adventures of Tarzan and any Jungle Girl comic like I have grown up with this character forever so I know a lot about it I know how fun it could be and I really like a lot of the interpretations we've seen of Tarzan recently I love the Scarsgard movie I think it is m- amazing how they made that work kind of like hook where it's like let's go back to the jungle i think that's cool but when you say you're gonna reinvent tarzan for a 21st century audience all i could think of is you're gonna give him a cell phone you're gonna like what have somebody live stream it is jane gonna be like an influencer and she finds him or do you mean like is it going to be like a gay allegory? Is it going to be like a slave allegory? Are you going to have him be a character of color? Is Jane going to be a person of color? Is it going to be a really fucked up metaphor for like, oh man, this this feral beast who is dark skinned is saved by the white colonists? I really hope it's not that. I really hope it's not that. But I have real doubts that this the story is going to do anything right right? I don't know. I made the joke on Twitter, like, they're going to make him an influencer and he's going to live stream something? Like, no, please. What you think is fun is not what other people think is fun, but I'm all here for, I'm all here for a Tarzan movie, man. I love Tarzan. I want to talk Tarzan all the time. My name is practically Tarzan if you get rid of the Z at the end. Like, that is my name. I love Tarzan. So do it. I'm, I'm all for doing it, but I don't know what you mean when you say reinvent the character. The thing is, like, that character, and it's like the all the Edgar Rice Burrow characters exist in the time period. They're built, the 20th century, that kind of, like, turn of the century era. That's when those characters work. It's kind of why you can never do a John Carter of the modern day, because what do you do? That character makes sense for, like, this guy looking to escape that time period. I don't know. It's weird, but... I, I'm down for more Tarzan. I will always be down for more Tarzan. So how could I be disappointed? Just confused. Just confused. And now before we get to our last kind of piece of news that I wanted to talk about, this one just kind of came on my radar. Uh, if we do a live show tomorrow, I'll probably talk about this more. But Todd McFarlane <laughs> just took to, he took to Twitter. He like painted some words like, Spawn news coming tomorrow. Spawn movie news, I should say, coming tomorrow. I'm like, Todd, what do you... I can't hate him, though. Like, as much as I, I think Todd is a weird man, and I don't really like everything about him personally, he's one of the smartest businessmen in all of comic books and entertainment. Like, he has just built a name for himself that is unmatched and unparalleled. I respect the hell of him. So tomorrow, we're getting some Spawn movie news. Does that mean a trailer? Does that mean a casting? Does that mean a director? Do they finally work out a deal where they're going to let him direct the movie? Please, for the love of God, let him direct the movie. 
I don't. I can't think of anything I want more in my lifetime than a Todd McFarlane directed Spawn movie. I want that more than anything. Oh, please do it. And dude, cast me. Dude, okay, Todd, I will literally take acting classes if you can get me any role in Spawn. I, I heard they were doing like a Salmon Twitch TV show. I'll, I'll play either of them, dude. I'll play the clown, dude. I'll play fucking, I'll play the violator, dude. I Like, I'll play, let's look up some Spawn characters right now and see which ones I should play. Because that's that's what I want to do with my life. I want to play Spawn characters. That's that's the new that's, that's the new thing I'm doing with my life. Ugh, these all are boring. Give me the cool ones. Give me the cool named ones. Overt kill. I'll be Cygor. Oh yeah, fuck yeah. I'll be Cygor. That'd be cool. That would be cool, man. Who? I guess. Uh, is it Redeemer? Is that the? Is that like the anti-spawn? That's kind of popular. I'll be, re- I'll be I'll be all of them. Fuck it, man. Just make me like an old spawn. I'll be the gunslinger. You know? Come on, dude. Hire me, please. Hire me. Todd. My guy. I want you to do this more than anybody. You gotta let me do it, man. Let me help you. Let me help you, baby. Todd, baby. I want to do spawn with you. Let's make a spawn movie forever. You can uh you can keep you can keep Jamie Foxx attached, but you let me play all the villains, please. I have so many mixed feelings on Spawn, and I, I just want to do like an entire video. I, I actually, I think when the, if we actually get a movie, I'm going to do a live stream where it's just me reading Spawn comics and watching my brain melt because I love Spawn so much, but I hate the character more than anything in comic books. It is so infuriating and intense, and it's so bizarre. But Spawn movie news is coming tomorrow, so everybody stay tuned for that. God help us all. <laughs> like, what the hell are you doing, Todd? You're insane. That's not all, though. I do have one thing I wanted to end on, because this is kind of like the recent news, so I thought I'd put it last. Uh, We got the writers for the Avengers films. Yeah, and it's kind of like Kevin Feige must watch a lot of Rick and Morty, because we're getting a lot of Rick and Morty people coming over to Marvel recently. Even Dan Harmon working on, like, the original script for Doctor Strange. Jessica got coming over to do She-Hulk, Attorney at Law. And we got Jeff Loveness, who created some of the... who wrote some of the better episodes of Rick and Morty is doing Quantumania, and then he's doing the Kang Dynasty, which I like him doing this more than I like Michael Waldron doing Secret Wars. Because Secret Wars feels like an inspiration attack leeching off of Multiverse of Madness, which had a god-awful script. But also, there were some good scripts in Loki, even if the show was shot ugly and didn't satisfy me. I would just say, like, I'm still iffy on Waldron, but I think Loveness has honed into the right thing, and that is turning the Rick and Morty pop culture bubble into what the MCU has become. Because I think those... you, you I don't think you have Rick and Morty success without the success of the MCU. I think the two leech off each other perfectly, not just because the creators go back and forth with like some weird incestuous trap working together, but I just think like those two stories are so symbiotic and connected in terms of the stories they are telling, the jokes they are making. They are the banes on pop culture today. And Loveness knows how to do that a little more self-aware, kind of over-the-top, subversive thing, more than Waldron, who does the fan servicey stuff. I don't hate either of them in terms of writers. I don't love either of them in terms of writers. But I'm more excited for something called the Kang Dynasty than Secret Wars, given the work I have seen Loveness do. A Kang story is a lot like a Citadel episode of Rick and Morty. And that is where he wrote the best finale to a season, the Citadel stuff. And then Waldron doing his kind of Citadel thing where it's like Multiverse of Madness wasn't very good. So it's mixed bag currently. I do think there's an argument to be made. I'm not going to make it there. Like I was reading some tweets. I was like, does it matter who writes a Marvel movie? They're getting two unknowns for Fantastic Four. Doesn't matter who directs a Marvel movie, they just get two unknowns to do anything everyways. The thing I want to say about that is, yeah, it does. Uh, it, it's both. It's both. Yes, it doesn't matter, but yes, it does matter. So it doesn't matter because there's already a studio head telling you what the story needs to be, how you need to write this, where it needs to go, and how you need to direct this, the shots you need to make. They actually said, like, we don't really do action. We have that in-house and people do that for us. But it's also like, it matters because that is how you get 
James Gunn and Taika Waititi's. These people breaking through to get their own vision in the stories. And I don't know if Loveness or Waldron would be the guys that could break through, but Giacchino did. He made a World by Night thing, made it this like really cool inspirational 30s throwback to 70s Marvel comics with a bunch of blood and gore. And that's kind of a little more interesting than anything else going on at Marvel right now. So it does matter when you get a writer who is creative, but it's also going to matter if you get a director who is willing to take those chances. When you get like a gun in Watiti, they are doing both parts of it, right? So it does matter. It also doesn't matter because they're already so in Studio House. And all of those guys, you know, Shakeman, Shackman, I should say Waldron, Loveness, and Destin Cretton. And I'd say Coogler even, even though Coogler's like a visionary. I think all those guys are good at working in-house for Disney and Marvel. So it doesn't really matter, but it's kind of crazy the chokehold that Rick and Morty and the MCU have over pop culture right now, and the same people are working on all of it. So the bubble is going to burst on all that eventually. Until then, we're probably never going to see a Blade movie. <laughs> but that is all the news we have this week. Again, a full news episode. We ran for longer than I expected, which is really nice to see. So what is your favorite thing that we talked about this week? To me, it's Planet of the Apes. Give me more Planet of the Apes all day. And whatever Spawn is going to be, I will inject that into my veins. So thank you guys for watching this rendition of The Geek Wave. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. As always, you can check me out on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck.